running through your mind. Like, why did we read that Bible passage here this morning? Uh, If you actually look at it, it's at the end of the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 16, and Paul begins to give an incredibly long list of names, names that are not very easy to pronounce, so Karen, thank you for reading it here this morning. Uh, Fantastic, yeah. Um, And and you can kind of sit there and think, why? Of all the places in the Bible we could have read this morning, why, why there? Or even push a little bit further, you could say, you know, why is that part of the Bible even included? I mean, was, is that the best use of time to be looking at a list of names that are hard to pronounce, seem kind of random, um, really don't make necessarily a big difference in our life? Why include it? And so we're going to get to that question in a moment, but before I answer that question for you, I would like you to consider a question this morning for me. And it's a question I've been asking people. Um, I've asked a variety of different people in different circumstances and situations. And I I hope I don't send you too far off on a tangent here this morning that you'll still kind of focus in a little bit. But it's a question that I think really uh, makes us think and makes us think about what is important and what is a priority in our life. And so here's the question. If you could be any age for the rest of your life, what age would you be? And why? I think about that. Maybe over lunch today, you know, you kind of think, okay, what kind of conversation will we have? If you could be any age for the rest of your life, what age would you be and why? Now, I was going to kind of throw it out to fate and see if anyone would like to answer, but I was worried that everyone wouldn't put their hands up. And so I asked this of a group of people that are meeting with me on Wednesdays for Christianity 101. And two brave souls out of that group have come forward and said they're going to answer that question for us live here this morning. And so I got a mic here, and Kathy's going to be the first one. So we've got to kind of turn around a little bit. I told I wouldn't make her come to the front, so let's give Kathy a round of applause. This is... And so it's all yours. Thanks, Joel. I'm not so sure I came forward. I recall being asked oh. <laughs> in, in a way that it was going to be hard to say no. Um, There's a word for that. It's called voluntold. <laughs> that's exactly what happened. I was voluntold. So um, at our uh, program... A week ago Wednesday, I made the mistake of answering the question, so here I am. Um, And I picked my Freedom 55 year, which I hasten to add was not all that long ago. Um, But it was a transformative year for me. I uh, uh, didn't see God's plan at the time, but what his plan was, was that I was going to conclude my long career Um, and do a 180 pivot into full-time volunteering, which in my case uh, became fostering. So in that year, a little delightful, stoic little girl uh, was literally dropped at my doorstep, and that has transformed my life completely. So that's why I chose that year. Thank you. Thank you. And not, not moving too far down the aisle. I notice people are getting really nervous. They're like, he's got a mic. I'm getting away from this guy. But, um, and that's going to share uh, as well. Thanks, Joel. And yes, Joel asked. And how can you say no to Joel? So, <laughs> um, so when Joel asked that question, I found it really difficult. I start overthinking everything. And I think through. And I thought, well, my 20s, that was really fun. But I, didn't, I wasn't married to my husband. I didn't have um, our four children. So I didn't want to be there without them. Then I thought about the 30s. Things were really busy. It was a lot of fun, but they were really, really busy. So I chose now um, because I didn't want to look to the future uh, because what if one of those people weren't in my life anymore because something um, happened? And so I choose now. Uh, It's a different phase of our life. Uh, We're getting to spend a lot of time together, but getting to watch the kids grow and go on and and start their lives too. So I chose now. And so I've asked a random, I've asked a variety number of people that very question. I've asked our staff at the church. Um, I've asked this group on Wednesday night. I've asked the guys on Tuesday night for beer books and banter. And what's interesting is I've drawn some conclusions. And I would suggest that as you think about the, the age you would choose, that likely these two factors will play a significant role in determining, I think, what age you would choose. And it comes down to, oftentimes is the people we want with us 
And a secondary factor is often those pivotal moments in life, those defining moments in life. Because what I find interesting as I ask people to share a little bit of their story and a little bit of their answer, pivotal moments isn't simply defined by those great moments in life when everything goes well for us, everything goes according to plan. That, that may be in there. But oftentimes, it's those moments that were difficult, that were challenging, that maybe have even brought us to a place of feeling overwhelmed. But as Kathy said, were transformational, made a difference in our life. And so as you think of that question, think of how you would answer. Think of the people that, that you would want with you because getting the age isn't right. It's speaking about a greater truth. And that is the reality of life. What is important to us? Who is it important to have with us? If we start to push it a little bit further, we, we come to a place of saying, if, God, if we want God to be a part of our lives, then how does that start to play out? And as I start to realize more and more in my life, in the reality of the stories that you read in the Bible, in just hearing people share a story of their faith, oftentimes the reality of Jesus becomes more clear in their lives because these same two factors, pivotal moments and people. Now what you probably realize is oftentimes we cannot control all the moments in life. We may want to, but oftentimes life may be taking us down one path and then suddenly we're taken to the left or we're taken to the right, but I believe we can be intentional, perhaps not about setting up pivotal moments, but we can be intentional about the people we want in our life. And I'm sure for, for many of us here this morning, we come to a different place. We're, we're on the spectrum of faith. There's, there's some people who perhaps have been following Jesus for, for many years, and, and, and they continue to want to desire to follow and to know him more. And as you start to think back, you can probably realize that there has been people along the way who have helped encourage you, helped to support you, helped to establish you in growing in your faith. There may be others here this morning thinking, well, you know, I, I'm kind of interested in Jesus. I, I'm not really sure who he is or, or what it's going to mean for my life. And, and I would first of all say it is fantastic that you're here this morning. It is great that you're at a place of saying, I'm at least open to asking questions, to, to being honest about my doubts, uh, to, to having skepticism within my life. This is where we want you to be. Listen, we don't come here because we have figured it all out. We come here because we are wanting to figure out more of who Jesus is, and we want to surround people around us who can help encourage us to lean into Jesus in those crucial moments of life. And so Annette and Kathy were great enough to answer my question. I'll, I'll answer the first question I started the morning with. Why the list? Why this random list that to you and me just may seem rather odd, but to Paul, who wrote this list, it would have been significant. You see, Paul is the one who is used by God to, to really bring this message of Jesus into so many countries throughout his lifetime. Paul was also the one that was used by God to, to write most of what we have now as the New Testament. And it was through these, these letters that, that Paul would step into people's lives. And we can look back at Paul and think, wow, he's incredible. Look at all the things that he has done. But Romans 16 reminds us that he did not do it on his own. He had people with him. He had people supporting him. He had people coming in behind him to encourage him and to lead him and to draw him closer and closer to Jesus because I'm sure Paul like all of us had questions had doubts had uncertainties had moments that brought great joy moments that brought incredible disappointment and I think one of the key factors was the people that God brought into his life and so we look at that list of names and we can't go through them all but we look at Phoebe the very first one mentioned we don't know a ton about her, but we do know that, that she was likely fairly wealthy. 
She was likely the one who helped support Paul in his ministry, in, in going out and in reaching others. You see, Paul couldn't do what he did on his own. He needed people like Phoebe. Or we read of Priscilla and Aquila, another couple that we know a little bit about through their story in other places in the Bible. They were actually forced to leave their original home because of the Roman Empire. And they were still devoted and desiring to lead others to Jesus. And Paul makes an interesting thing, and I love the translation we had this morning. You know, some translations say, you know, they, they risked their lives, but in the NRSV it says, they risked their neck for me. You know that whole saying of, you know, you're going to put my neck on the line for you? Priscilla and Aquila did that for Paul. That is something significant. They would have been people who would have been significant in Paul's life. And then the final uh, list of names, Androsius and Junia, they had the distinction of getting to know and hanging out with Paul in prison. In prison. Probably not an easy place, probably not a, uh, not a place where there would have been tons of joy and celebration, but they would have been there together encouraging and supporting one another. Because oftentimes these pivotal moments in life, either good or bad, have the power and the ability to either draw us closer to Jesus or to begin to push us further and further away. And one of the key factors in allowing life to draw us closer to Jesus, I believe, is surrounding us, surrounding ourselves with people who will encourage us to continue to trust in God in those moments of abundance and in those times of disappointment and discouragement. As a church, if you're new this morning and you're kind of wondering, you know, you know, what are we all about? I would summarize it this way. As a church, we are all about leading people to Jesus. Because we believe above all else, I believe above all else, that Jesus is, is true to his word when he says, I have come so that you may have the abundant life. You may have the life worth living. And so we want to continue to be drawing people to Jesus. But what we realize is that's not an individualistic pursuit. We need each other to grow and to encourage and to be equipped. And, and so one of the strategies of, of what we do is we simply create these gatherings to come together, to learn together, to be encouraged together, to be supported together. Now, now the most obvious one is what we do here on Sunday morning. It's, it's, it's our largest gathering. It's always set on the same time, in the same place, on the same day. But I would suggest that it may not be our most effective one. Now, it could be a great starting point. If you're just someone who's maybe seeking and, and wondering more and more, you know, is, is Jesus someone that I want? Then it's fantastic that you are here. If you make the commitment to come and make Sunday morning a regular reality in your life, because I know there's a lot of other places you could be, we'll make at least these two commitments to you. We will be done by 1140. We'll be done by 1140. So I've got a few minutes left to go. And the second one is we will talk lots about Jesus. We'll talk lots about Jesus. Because we want to learn more about him. We, 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 we want to tell people more about him. Now there's going to be a lot of other things that are going to happen. There's going to be times where we're going to kind of annoy you. There are many times we may frustrate you. We'll try to only do that twice every week. We believe in baseball principles here. On the third annoyance, you can, you can walk out, no questions asked. But this is our first gathering. We come together and learn more about Jesus, get to know other people who also want to follow in his ways. But as I said, this, this may be our largest, but it may not be our most effective. There's a pastor in Atlanta named Andy, Andy Stanley who says, you know, it gets more effective when we get out of rows and into circles. Get out of rows and into circles. And so we have a ministry of small groups here at the church, life groups, where, where we get into homes, into coffee shops, into bar, bars around tables, over a cup of coffee, a side of nachos, your, your favorite pint, whatever it's going to be, whatever it's going to take. 
Because as we come together and we spend life together, as we learn the stories, I, I mean to hear the stories of all the other people on the Wednesday night, our purpose in gathering on Wednesday night is not just to learn about Jesus, it's to learn about one another so that we can grow together. We are better together. It's one of the foundational biblical principles. In the book of Genesis, when God creates the heavens and the earth, on the sixth day, he creates man, he creates Adam, and God's commentary is this, it's not good for man to be alone, and so he creates woman. And here we see this first community together. You go all the way through the, through the Old Testament, and as much as they mess it up, God does not give up on the principle of the importance of being together. Because that's where we learn, that's where we grow, that's how we encourage each other. Jesus did it as well in the New Testament. He, Jesus comes into the world, and he could have been probably way more effective on his own, but he gra- gathered around a group of 12 individuals who messed up more than they got it right, but they grew together, and those 12 began the leaders of the early church and the movement of what we are still a part of, of leading others to Jesus. And so my question for all of us is who's on your list? Who's on your list? And are there people on that list who will help draw you closer to Jesus? Doesn't mean they're perfect. Doesn't mean we get it right all the time. But will they be there to encourage you and to support you in the midst of all of life? As a first step, it may be simply saying, you know what, maybe I want to learn more about this Jesus and figure out what it is. And so maybe just simply coming here on Sunday mornings is a good place to start. It's a great place to start. But perhaps there's a second step, and the second step is to moving into a smaller group, into, into a gathering of people who are going to be honest about faith, honest about life, honest about struggles, but honest about wanting to know how Jesus speaks into all of those places. There'll be people at the welcome table to my left, and if you want to learn more about our groups, that's a great place to begin. This morning, we, we celebrated with Mike and Leslie just the importance of, of, of raising Sutton in the ways of Jesus. And, and maybe as a parent, you come to a place of saying, you know what, I, I want this for my kids. I want those pivotal moments. I want those crucial relationships in their lives. How does it happen? Well, great that you're here today, because today is camp day. And camp is one of the incredible ways that basically tick two of those boxes in creating fantastic relationships and creating pivotal moments in kids' lives. There's adults here, myself included, that went to camp as a kid and still look back with great fondness in terms of the friends and the relationships that were made and also those pivotal moments that were experienced that helped lead us closer to Jesus. What's great about all these camps, they come from various places in this area, in, in, in Ontario. And, and, and they all have the same goal of leading kids to Jesus, but they do it in different ways. Some use lakes, some use horses, some use hockey sticks and pucks, some use other sports. They can use whatever they want to use. They want to lead people to Jesus. And so following the service, go and have a conversation with them. There's incredible things that is happening through these camps. And perhaps it's an opportunity for you to send your your child or your grandchild. Or maybe you don't have kids, but you think, you know what, I would love to see more kids go. We have a camp fund here at the church. If you want to give a donation this morning, just mark camp fund on the envelope, drop it in the plate, and it's an assistance program to help get kids to camp. Why do we do what we do? Why do we show up on a Sunday morning? Why do we develop these small groups? We know your life is busy. We know there's so many things going on, which is why we drop it down and to say we want to be all about leading people to Jesus. And one of the best ways we do it is not as individuals, but with the support of others. And so what's your next step? Will you consider joining with us As a community of faith, we draw closer and closer to Jesus. I invite you to please stand as we continue to sing together.